Welcome to Talking Heavy, a brand new weekly boxing and MMA show focusing on both sports in Wales. Today is episode one and we have Dewey Powell from Boxing Wales, the number one boxing website in the country. And also we have newly uh, licensed British Boxing Border Control referee Chris Jones. Welcome guys. Thanks, mate. Nice one. Thanks, Thanks for joining us. Um, we'll get straight into it then. Dewey, like I said, you own the number one website in Wales covering boxing, boxingwales.com. It's known all, all out, throughout the UK. Um, tell us how you got started into, into the sport and you, where you got into it, basically. Um, I'm from a little tiny village uh, just north of Caerphilly in the valleys. Um, and growing up, it's rugby or football. You know, I always enjoyed football, but I played rugby. But every, from like probably the age of 11, to you know my late teens every now and again you'd spend a week in a boxing gym and our boxing gym um was die gardener's gym in Gethlige. and you'd lit i'd literally go there for a week and you wouldn't wouldn't tell your parents um you know you'd just sneak up there and i'd spend about a week there and then the weekend would come and it was time to play i was never you know never a great athlete but it was time to play rugby then i wouldn't go to the boxing gym for you know six months sometimes but there was all you know there's always that connection with boxing that there was always a mystique i suppose and then when I came into my late teens, um, there was a, my school was one of the only schools in Wales now to have a boxing gym. And um, the coach there was Paul Woody Greenway, who I think he had about 40 odd professional fights. I think he won about 10 and lost 30. Um, and I did a couple of those sessions in school. Um, like it was like an after school sort of mm. setup. Um, and really, really enjoyed them. I was no, you know, no good, but you know, really enjoyed um, just hitting bags and pads, really. You weren't allowed to spar because it was in school. And, um, you know, you don't have to look at me twice to know I'm not a non-athlete at all. Um, but I was quite academic and I enjoyed, you know, subjects like history and English. And when I was looking then what to do in, you know, further education in university, I wanted to do something fairly creative, something to do with writing. And my big passion by that point, you know, it was during the days when I was a teenager of Hatton and Calzaghe, and they were like the main two in Wales. It was after Lennox Lewis had retired, and Kozaghi was massive, and Hatton was massive, um, and I had a passion for boxing. I wanted to be involved in boxing some way, and I, I knew I wasn't good enough to be involved in as an active participant. But I was quite ac academic, and I ended up doing journalism in university. I never did journalism because I wanted to write about like you know local court reports or local council meetings or you know, any, any aspect of that. But, you know, my way into boxing was through writing. Um, I enjoy writing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm okay at it as well, you know, and I was writing for different websites here and there. And then in 2012, five years ago, it's the actual anniversary of the website, boxingworlds.com next week. Um, I decided to set my own website up and, you know, boxing is fantastic. It's not like, you know, I've got friends in football and rugby and it's very, very difficult to get access to athletes. Um, where I, you know, I've, I've said before and I say it again, I don't think there's a person in Walsh Boxing who wouldn't pick up the phone to me. It's a very accessible sport. So, you know, I, I've been lucky. I've been able to talk to, you know, managers, fighters, promoters from Wales and the UK. I've, the access, um, you know, I, I can't complain about the access. Pretty much every gym, you know, you ask to go to to get photos of the guys in the mm -hmm. gym. Um, you know, even sparring, you know, they'll let you do it. So, you know, that was my way into boxing. I've been lucky with it, you know, with the website. Um, you know, it, it does quite well. You know, good, decent social media following as well, which is pretty much, you know, how, how I measure how well we do. Yeah, well, it, it's got, looking at it from the outside, you've got a good few thousand followers on Twitter mm. and on Facebook. Like, like I said, it's, it's really well known. And for me and, and obviously any other boxing fans, not just in Wales, but all the UK, when it comes to Welsh boxers or Welsh boxing, your website is the first one they hit up. Yeah. Pretty confident. I'd, I'd say, you know, it, it takes a lot of dedication as well, really, because, like, you know, I, I'm not playing the smallest violin in the world, but, you know, you don't, you don't really get paid for it. I get a couple hundred quid a year advertising, and it's meant to be a hobby. It's meant to be, you know, like I did journalism in university and there's transferable skills that I use in my career. But, 
you know, the boxing side of things now is meant to be a hobby. It's more like a second job, really, because, you know, you find yourself doing a bit and then doing a bit more and then doing a bit more. And before you know it, it's like 11 o'clock and the missus isn't happy that, you know, you're downstairs in the living room ignoring her, typing away. So, um, you know, it takes a certain amount of dedication, but it is rewarding. You know, I get all this access, not just in the gym. You know, I've covered fight, you know, fights in America. I've covered fights in Europe and, of course, you know, in Britain and, and in Wales. And I think there's been like two shows I've missed in like the last five years in Wales. And I know we don't have a lot of shows, but that's, you know, over the course... Of, of, of a year, that's a lot of shows to cover. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I try to do as much coverage as I can. It's like some some shows, you know, they, they might just be full of all prospects and journeymen, but I try to do an individual report for for every fight. And obviously that maximizes, um, like, clicks, you know, and yeah, I suppose you're splitting everything up. Um, so you'll get more um, traffic, but, you know, at, at the same time, it's nice to give a focus on each individual boxer. It takes a bit of graft. If there's a show, say there was the one in Swansea recently in the Br- Brangwen Hall, um, I, I do the majority of my writing at ringside, but then mm. you tidy it up, make sure that everything's factually correct later on in the night when I get home with an internet connection to post the stories. Um, you and say your articles are quite detailed, like you said, yeah. with the Brangwen Hall show. You had the, the fight reports, and then you had like little pieces on each fighter. Like for myself, for example, you wrote uh, like a little couple of paragraphs on that, and I think that's what stands out from a lot of other websites and boxing news especially you'll see an article it will just write about the fights and the fight does but then your website will go into that a little bit more detail and shine a little bit more light on the fight does and i think that's what makes it stand out for yeah. myself from the outside and that for a long time that's got to be my usp because you know if i do what everyone else is doing then i'm probably going to get moderate or below average traffic if i try to go a bit above and beyond and sometimes it's only you know, the small details can make a big difference, but and they only come from a 30-second conversation with the fighter as they're leaving the ring. And, you know, whether they've injured, uh, you know, they've suffered an injury or whether they're planning to be out next. And there's those little details that add up. And I think that's why, you know, the, the website does so well, really. You, like you say, starting in 2012, you were basically the, apart from like Gareth Jones, who's been doing it for years, but you were the only really dedicated website and, and journalist for Welsh boxers and Welsh boxing so the last couple of years like I started a website up and a few other websites have popped up and the coverage has, has grown for for Welsh boxing all stemming from you basically like when I started a website up I was looking at boxing Wales that's where where I need to be or that's what I need to do so what's your opinion of people like myself and other sites that have sort of jumped on the bandwagon really you could say I, I well it's it's except you know at one stage that was me that was you know i had next and when i first started writing about boxing i was probably 17 or 18 years old i had no qualifications in journalism or whatever at that stage i was a complete newbie and you learn from your mistakes hmm. um you know like anyone and you've got everyone's got to start somewhere and i don't think you know if if the the entry barrier if the entry level was so high then quite literally nobody would get started so You'd have your your full-time journalists who cover a, you know, a, a range of sports for the newspapers and the BBC and you know different platforms who dip into the boxing when big events happen. But then underneath that, you'd have absolutely nothing. And like, it, I, you know, I'm not digging out anyone, but you see like some of the mainstream media outlets, they're only interested in Welsh boxing if Anthony Joshua's fighting at the Millennium Stadium or if there's right, a potential yeah. of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, what I class as active <coughs> boxers in Wales are boxers who have boxed within the last two years. You sh- it should really be a year, but there's not that many shows in Wales. So uh, you know, I give them a year leeway in the listings on the website. And there are, I think there's nearly 80 active, what I class as active professional boxers in Wales. So it's not just when Anthony Joshua potentially comes to town, mm. even though he still hasn't. You know, there's a lot of stories to be told. And it is a struggle <coughs> to tell them all. And I don't tell them all as, as much as I would like to, because like I say, it's meant to be a hobby. Um, but you know, there's a lot of stories, and sometimes the best stories are from the fighters. You might, you may not necessarily have heard of. It's like <clears throat> this perfect example is. I like to think I know when boxers are fighting and what fights are happening mm-hmm. in in terms of Welsh boxers. But then I look on Boxing World's Twitter, and you've pulled out that Henry James has fought in Scunthorpe yeah. and mm-hmm. come away with a draw, and I'm like. How does he not? How yeah, does he know that? How did you spend um, all your spare time on box rec? Or a, lo- a lot <laughs> of people in boxing are grateful for the. You know, I, w- I would say that in 
I have very little, you know, I'm always open to negative feedback and I ask people for negative feedback in order to improve, but I get very little and that's because people are grateful for what I do. Mm -hmm. And with that, people contact me with news. So it's not mm -hmm. always me yeah. phoning up people, you know, different stakeholders in boxing in Wales and saying, can you tell me this, this and this. Sometimes people will tell me um, and it's a two way process. And it, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's a difficult balance because sometimes you need to criticize things. You need to, you know, if there's a show, for example, I'm not naming any show in particular, but if there's a show and there's not one interesting fight on there, you need to so you need to say that next time this show needs a title fight or it needs an eliminator. Constructive mm. criticism. Yeah, yeah. And and you, you did in one of your yeah. recent articles, and I think the show you're talking about, they've taken it on board because yeah, they've yeah. got very active on social media because you said he was probably missing um, a title fight or a 50-50 fight because yeah. And there's that balance then of like offering constructive criticism and still then trying to promote the stories. And I'm not, obviously I'm not there as a PR person, but you know, you, you want Welsh boxing to have a certain level of platform, certain level of awareness with the general public. And you know, I think that's where Boxing Wales fills that void. And I will say that the, the main reason for the website doing well is not because what the website does, is because there's an appetite within the general public to support boxing. And we just fill that void. If we weren't there, you know, there might be another website that, you know, people would get behind them. So, you know, it's, it's a two-way process. You've definitely <clears throat> hit a gap in the market at the time you come on. And like I say, you're, you're the front runner. You're the main, the main news source for people like myself who, who run a website and, and all the other websites that have, have popped up. So do you see yourself as sort of the benchmark or...? Not a benchmark because you know I think the best writer that I I most enjoy listening to oh reading sorry um, is Gareth Jones, who um, does boxing news and does his his series of books as well. I really really enjoy his books. I think they're fantastic. I think Gareth's the best writer. I might be the most active, the most active I suppose yeah, you know, yeah. the one who posts the most. And I I could if I had the time for every tweet like a Henry James um, has been in an away corner somewhere in the north of England and managed to pull off a result that was fantastic against, against you know, stacked against the odds. Um, I would love to do like a 500 word story on that, phone Henry, get his side of things, mm. give it a bit of background, but you can't always do that. So, yeah. you know, I, I suppose I'm probably the most prolific on social media is what I would say. Right, we're going to take a short break, but after the break, we'll discuss where Boxing Wheels has taken you and what fights, what were your favorite fights you covered. So we'll be back after this. Welcome back to part two. We'll get straight back into it with Dewey. So, like you say, Boxing Wheels took off from 2012, and you did touch on that it's taking you to America and Europe. Um, can we go into that a bit more? And, and I know you're part, yeah. sort of part of Team Team Cleverly, so um, can we get into that? Yeah, Nathan's pretty much the reason why I'm involved in boxing as much as I was. When I was first getting into it, Nathan gave me so much access, and he was like world champion at the time, 2011, and I was like 18, 19, and I pretty much, in between being a student, whenever I could, I'd be in the gym watching him, and I had great access to Nathan. So, you know, I credit him with involving me so much and opening so many doors for me then, because, you know, I constantly covering Nathan's career from that stage and um, you know it did open doors with other boxers and other managers and trainers and everything um, and he's coincidentally you know he's had a good career to cover you know I've been lucky like that um, plenty of good fights the you know the I remember the first Tony Bellew fight was you know an absolute thumper mm. um, I can remember them both in a press conference after the urine samples were red because they, they'd beaten each other's bodies that bad um, and when Nathan fought in, he fought in America, you know, literally out of my own pocket, there isn't a budget to Boxing Wales is what I put into it. Um, I went to watch him fight Andro, and Andrew Fanfara, which was, again, it was an absolute thumper, even though the PBC, I was the only press person in the stands, basically, which I didn't appreciate, but, you know, we'll get over that. I'll forgive Al Heyman. But, um, <laughs> in case he's listening. <laughs> yeah, just in case. But, um, yeah, that was another thumping fight. and. You know, he come out of that fight again with you know blood and guts. You know, literally, um, that was a fantastic fight, and they're amongst the best fights I've ever seen. But also, you know, on the flip side, I've been lucky to be ringside for. I remember when Gavin Reese fought John Watson for the British title. I think that was 2011. That was the that was the first best fight I'd seen. That was the way I walked away. I thought that had quite literally everything. You know, comebacks, knockdowns, 
all sorts of drama. Um, but then you go to Welsh level, Tony Pace against Lance Sheehan was a 10 round non-title fight, I think. And Chris Way against Frankie Borg for the Welsh was, middleweight title. Was my favorite live fight in the flesh fight. Yeah. My favorite I've they, ever seen. I, you know, I've been lucky to be ringside. And the thing is, a lot of these shows, like, especially the small old shows, I'm sat in my seat here, my desk is here and the ring's there. You know, you yeah. can't, you've, the only person with a better view is the referee. Yeah. You know, that's... <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you spot silly like that. And, you know, I, one thing I'd say, if you've got a passion about boxing, there is a way f for everyone to get involved. And if you give it your best, you know, it can take you to different places. It might even just take you around the block and you might be lucky you find it, you know, a great fight there. Yeah, that was pretty much my... I was never going to be a fighter due to medical issues and things, but I always, I've always, my brother was a boxer, I've grown up with boxing, so I was thinking, how? And it just turned out I, I was drunk one night and responded to a tweet and, <laughs> and started writing boxing articles and I'm nowhere near on, on your level, but sort of, like I say, I looked at Boxing Wales and that's where it needs to be. So... To a lot, of, a lot one, of people yeah. like rely on boxing wheels now like myself if i'm on the road and there's no coverage for a show i'll be like uh <laughs> what's it called refreshed in the tweets on boxing wheels to see the results yeah, yeah, of the fight because yeah. well we were in we were the first podcast we did i That's come right, over your yes. house yeah, yeah. and there was no coverage on the tv and it was refreshed on my twitter to find out the results of the fight from boxing wheels so we we'll do it round by round as well sometimes yeah like it tends to be if it's a uh, prospect, yeah, it's a journey one. I won't bother doing that yeah. by round, but if it's like the most recent one we've done was Lee Salby uh, against Jonathan Victor Barros, yeah. I did like minute by minute updates yeah. of that. And I've got to be honest, you know, there is an audience for it, yeah. there's not many outlets or not as many outlets as I'd like covering boxing. And I'm not like, you know, I don't want to be the only show in town, I want I want yeah. Welsh box, uh, genuinely, I want Welsh boxing to have all the coverage in the world that it could possibly get in Wales. Um, and you know the reason why like the round by round yeah. updates like that do well is because nobody else tends to do exactly, them like that. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And it, you know it's not easy because you know you can have a typo and look like a plonker, <laughs> or I've done you know, times, or you can you, you know make like silly little silly little mistakes because you only have a second to proofread it, um, and obviously you're on your own as well. But you know overall the reaction we get when we do those live updates, you know, is is really good. And, you know I can't fault you know the reaction we have there. We, we spoke about it on the way down here. Um, back to the present day, you said, like you say, Boxing Wheels is taking you everywhere. We put a, I think it was a tweet or, or a Facebook post out a week, two weeks ago that, not stepping back, but maybe winding it down slightly. So, and I, I seen a lot of responses. I hope you're not packing Boxing Wheels, because like we said, people rely on Boxing yeah. Wheels for their news. So. Um, for anybody obviously watching, what exactly are you going to do with Boxing Wheels now? What, what I've been priding the website on for so well, pretty much since we started is being a news service. And, you know, I quite enjoy news writing, you know, who, what, where, when and why and a couple of quotes in the middle. I quite enjoy that process of writing. Um, but it takes a lot of time, you know, it's a couple of phone calls just for a simple article, you know, to basically fact check and make, the, you get, make sure you get everything right. Um, but it's just a man's time and I'm struggling more and more for time. Like I say, it's meant to be a hobby. It's more like a second job sometimes and before you know it, you know, it's bedtime and, you know, you're back to the day job then. And I've even, like, I've even written stories on my half an hour lunch break in work because I won't have the time to do it, you know, at any time else. Um, so those, what I've tr done to try and combat those is do news roundups. So do like a news in brief, you know, bang, bang, bang. Yeah. Five different stories in, say, six, seven hundred words and try to do it as brief as I can that way. I don't really feel like that's telling the full story. So what I'm gonna do in future is just post news very simply on social media, um, literally just the pure facts, less, less background than I'd like to give, but that's all I can manage to give at the time. And what I'm gonna do on the website instead is make it more feature-based. So go into issues around boxing um, in a bit more detail. There'll probably be longer pieces. It might even match the word count. I think I've done something like 40,000 words from January to July, halfway through the year. Um, it might even match that word count, but it'll be a different focus that doesn't, doesn't demand a constant, you know, attention, a constant work, basically. So for people out there, Boxing Wales isn't going away. It's not, going, not completely. Not just retiring changing. Boxing Wales, <laughs> it just... Streamlined. Just yeah. change, slightly changing focus. The news will be there. 
but it won't necessarily be on the website or be on social media. You know, follow us on Twitter. You know, phone. I think it's nearly four and a half thousand people do, and I think that that's our core audience. I think on Facebook we've got more. It's like over eight thousand now, but it's more like friends and family of fighters who support the boxer rather than want to know Welsh boxing news. So I'd say, you know, for your pure news, follow us on Twitter um, and then go to the website for what I'd like to think are going to be more think pieces. Insightful yeah. articles. Maybe um, would it be stuff that the general boxing fan wouldn't wouldn't know about, like um, small for instance, shows. yeah, small old shows, or maybe about a training camp. Yeah, what, what I've been what I've been doing for on the website, pretty much the basic thing to describe it, the basic way to describe it, is I've been telling people what what the news is. It'd be what I want to do is to tell people why things are the way they are in boxing. You know, why a small hole boxer has to sell 100 tickets and make 100 pound, which is, you know, le obviously less than minimum wage. Explain, like, the economics behind that, which I think is a serious issue in Welsh boxing. I think boxers, and I, I don't really think there's anyone to blame, really. It's just because it's a niche sport. It's just the way it is. Yeah, I, I think that's one serious issue in sport. You know, we could, obviously, you've got the Conor McGregor, Floyd Mayweather show now, and lots of people wonder yeah. how on earth Conor McGregor has a boxing license. Well, there are plenty of other examples of people with equal or less boxing experience. There you go, there's one. <laughs> there's, and you knew that was coming through. <laughs> and there's, there's plenty of other examples, aren't there, that, you know, that to show this, this is a freak fight, certainly it is, because he's fighting Floyd Mayweather, and Freddie Flintoff was fighting, you know, the doorman of the bar that we're in. Um, but, you know, I just want to do more think pieces, I suppose, yeah. that explain why things are the way to, they are in boxing. To educate the, the general yeah. Boxing fan. Yeah. So for people, like you said, no panic. Boxing Wales is still going to be the number still, one. Still exists. Still there. Um, Twitter is at Boxing Wales. Yeah, uh, same on Facebook. Same on Facebook. I, I've actually seen, I've been to amateur shows and people walking around with Boxing Wales t-shirts on. Yeah, do you, know, do you know, I make like, I think we sell them for like £7.50. I could make them more expensive and make a couple of quid, but I'd rather people actually, you know, wear the t-shirts and... You sent me a patch once and I've never put on my shorts. Well, Sorry. next fight, <laughs> I didn't go on your shorts. That's, well, um, if I fight again. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, you know, I'm quite lucky as well, you know, like, I understood branding as well. I think the badge works quite well. It looks like mm. a shield almost, yeah. doesn't it? It's recognisable now as well. Yeah. Like people know it as a logo. It's like, it's like a sort of like a football club badge, I suppose, yeah. you know, it looks like. So, you know, we've got that brand which is recognised and it looks quite good. So, um, you know, I've been lucky to make the right decisions at the right time to get a website recognised. Definitely. Like you say, you're not going anywhere, you're still about. Mm. After the break, we're going to speak to Chris, new uh, referee on the block, and we'll get his history about that. Welcome back to part three, guys. We're going to speak to Chris now, yep. Swansea's only professional boxing referee. Yep. Um, that's recently happened. Yep. Uh, you, you're currently the manager of the gym in the LC too, yep. is that correct? Yeah, I'm health yeah. fitness manager of the LC, yes. yeah. yeah. But like I said, you're a professional boxing referee. Yeah. Um, I don't know many referees with the background you have. Mm -hmm. um, we'll start right to the beginning. Okay. You come from a, a combat background, yes. shall we say. So let's get into that. Where, where does it all stem yeah. from? It all stems from being a nine-year-old um, doing karate. Um, with the, so the karate kid movies and so on. The aim was always to be that black belt and it was all pristine to get to that black belt. So uh, I was very fortunate that my dad's cousin, Gus Gilbert, ran his own karate club in Morriston called Spats. So I joined there, loved it, fell in love with it straight away at the age of, yeah, I think I was nine or 10. After previously trying football, rugby and everything sort of growing up, I fell into the journey, uh, managed to make my way all the way to black belt at the age of 15. And along that way, in order to get your sort of brown belt, purple belt, black belt, you have this sort of referees and small competitions. Right. So doing that sort of process, you're in the middle, you're scoring, um, you're at the side sort of scoring, and you're refereeing from that. Very small, basic sort of sports hall, karate competitions and so on. But you need to do that to show you'll be able to do official in order to pass your grade in yeah. and so on. At the time when I got a black belt, uh, I wasn't interested then in going towards a first dance, second dance and so on. I wanted to get more into the fighting and the combat. I think I was 15, 16 years old. So I got into the full contact sort of kickboxing side. 
um, sort of training from that, to sort of um, competing, and I was getting from a mat into a ring. So doing three two-minute um, rounds of full contact kickboxing, um, the contact bottoms on, all kicks above the waist. Um, from there, fairly successful, I managed to get a uh, Welsh title out of it. Uh, I got nine fights in total with five wins. Um, but through that time, obviously, I um, started having working at the age of 16, 17 in leisure centres, which was shift work. Um, this meant I couldn't train as often, progressed into having a family, having children. So I sort of took a step back from the sort of training and so on. But I still wanted to be involved in the sport. And that then led me to sort of being a judge, helping out at a kickboxing shows, which I enjoy. You still part of the show, and uh, very similar to what Dewey said, you can sit ringside and you're watching that sport and that action taking place there. And the added benefit of being a judge, you get to score it, you get to sort of have your say and determine who wins, yeah, the red you, or blue. You were a part of the fight, you're yeah. part of that fight, and you've you got the concentration level on that. And I got a little bit of a buzz from that. It's what you're scoring and what you're seeing is getting a result for each fighter. Um, and as the sort of sport progressed more, um, with the kickboxing, there's so many sort of different sanctioning bodies and awarding bodies. Um, it's almost like alphabet spaghetti. There's so many WB, IEBFs and ISKAs and so on. But they are trying to sort of streamline it. So I wanted to ensure, if I was going to referee, I wanted to ensure that I had the qualification, um, I'd done the training behind it, so that if anyone sort of questioned my, me why I'm in that ring, I can show, look, I'm qualified, I've done the course, um, I've been active in doing this as well. This then led me to doing ISK qualifications um, in Birmingham with John Blackledge. That got me to a sort of C license as a kickboxing sort of referee. Did that a um, couple of shows in Swansea and in Sunderland in Cardiff. But then I got my sort of, I almost call it a big break, uh, doing the white collar sort of scene. That's, that was the first time I come across you. Yeah because my cousin was fighting on one of the shows. Yeah. I'm pretty sure you took a point off him for doing press-ups in the corner. Possibly. In, 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 in the middle of the fight, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> that was my first interaction with you, and that's how I knew you, as yes. you were the referee from the White Collar shows, yeah. which were, at the time, the biggest thing in Swansea. It, were, it, it was um, the biggest night out in Swansea. It was the biggest night out, and I think it was one of the first, definitely outside, obviously, the White Collar boxing emerged from London. What uh, Chris Ware and sort of the Funky Pump sort of show was doing in Oceana nightclub was one of the first away from London, and it was an event. It yeah. were pristine and were, proper. Yeah, like, I, the we guys were in taxes. Yeah, we were renting taxes, full on. It was, a, it was monkey. Yeah, yeah, it was a full a gentleman sort of um, diggy boat job, and for that they had proper uh, red corner, blue corner. The training went into it, uh, twelve weeks training and so on. But from a referee's point of view, I wanted to do as professional as I could. So I made sure I was in the sort of black attire or um, so on. I gave each uh, boxer sort of a rules meeting sort of thing. Um, and I conducted myself as a sort of professional referee would that I'd seen from previous uh, pro boxing shows. The advantage of that then, other sort of white collar boxing shows, and other, even sort of kickboxing shows were popping up around Swansea and South Wales. And a lot of people approached me, can I do their shows? As they, they thought, I'm quite honest, I'll score it and I'll, I'll referee as fair as I can. Um, and that sort of led me to sort of moving about everywhere. What also was emerging at the time is the sort of MMA scene. Um, and then, so when you're doing sort of kickboxing shows, which might have 12 bouts on it, four of them may be K1 and four of them may be an MMA. Yes, yeah. So for in order for me, I've never come from an MMA sort of background. I've done a bit of training, a couple of gyms. I thought I need to sort of ensure if I'm going to referee these or judge or score these, I need to know the ins and outs of what an armbar is, what these different choke holds are. So I then sort of done my research, went up to Birmingham and met Mark Goddard, our UFC referee, and he was doing a one-day course which basically focused on the unified rules of MMA. So breaking down the sort of stigma of head shots here, no knee shots here, the unified rules that was being born and created from the ABC in America, which the UFC were adopting. He was bringing it to the UK, and I sort of, I was sort of in the right place at the right time, jumped on board with him, and he sort of went through how a referee should conduct himself in an MMA, and also the judging and scoring part of that as well. So with that sort of knowledge and that qualification, that opened more shows up. Um, in South Wales, I managed to get on judging with Pain Pit, which then 
Obviously yeah. turned across to Cage Warriors Wales. Yeah. Um, there were a couple of shows in Clackley that I managed to get on. And I sort of, again, built my name, built my brand and so on. And I was getting recognised and sort of approached the referee and judge and me and so on. This then led to sort of, whilst all this was happening, the creation of the sort of UK MMAF and the IMAF. So these are sort of two organisations who really want to streamline the sport of MMA, particularly from an amateur sort of background. Um, so the International Mixed Martial Arts, or IMAF, they do European championships, which have previously taken place in Prague, they've taken place in Birmingham, but they do world championships, and they actually join in with the UFC on U International Fight Week so, yeah, in yeah, Las yeah. Vegas. they got one coming up now in November in Bahrain, so it truly is an international federation. So with my sort of previously doing it with Mark, uh, Mark Goddard, I managed to get my place on the UK MMAF, so the UK sort of arm of the IMAF, on their referees course um, through Mark Woodard in the Outlaw Gym in Tewkesbury. I managed to meet some very top referees there, like um, Neil Hall, Dan Moverheady, Andy Hay, all these sort of guys on this course with me who are currently refereeing and judging the big sort of Cage Warriors shows, the Bama shows in the UK. I thought as well as refereeing, I need to make sure I know how to judge and score a fight. This led to sort of um, the UK MMAF judges uh, course, which took place in Peterborough with UFC judge Ben Cartledge, uh, David Leatherby was on that as well. So I was getting my name about in the MMA scene, as well as doing sort of the white collar and the kickboxing sort of shows. So how, what kind of time frame are we looking at from maybe just starting refereeing kickboxing yeah. and going into the white collar to refereeing at the European Championships? What time frame? Uh, you're probably looking at about six years, I want to say. So you put, you put a fair bit yeah, into yeah. the MMA side of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, like it, it sounds like it's a quick progression. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. It like is, yeah. Going on the background. Um, Again, with, with Wales, we're not so blessed to have shows all the time, so I, it was just very sporadic that I could sort of be on these shows. Um, but yeah, it's probably is about six years of sort of getting in from a kickboxing into sort of that sort of level then. So it's, it's, although we'll go into boxing in a bit, yeah. this refereeing, in one way or the other, you, this was a path you had chosen a yes. long time ago, yeah. that you were going to ref in some sort of discipline. Yes, yeah, I enjoyed the aspect of being involved in a fight. And I, I also studied the rules. I studied how uh, a referee could get himself. I knew that if I made a decision on that split point, it was accurate. Because um, you often, you, you have got no time for missing a second. For example, particularly on the MMA, you've got to watch that fight there and know, are you going to step in and stop that fight? Could be too early. Or are you going to let him take further punishment as too late? Do you ever probably before a fight, yeah. if you're going to ref any, whether it be a white collar yeah. or pro MMA or what have you, do you ever think, I don't want to mess this up? Is there, is there a certain level of nerves or are you yes. just... Yeah, there's got to be nerves. But then that almost goes... As soon as you're in that ring and you've sort of got the two fighters and you're going through your pre-checks, the gum shield, that's a gum shield, uh, and so on. <laughs> going got gum shield. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. um, check, yeah. <laughs> checking the gloves. The nerves are gone. The adrenaline sort of takes over and you're almost doing a spiel. So you're bringing the fighters together and you're doing that spiel and safety and you're away and you're sort of, you're involved uh, tunnel vision on that fight. So we've gone from kickboxing refereeing yeah to European amateur MMA yeah. in six years. Yes. So we're going to take a quick break, but after the break, we'll talk to Chris about becoming a pro boxing referee. So we'll be back after this. Right, I'm back to part four, guys. We get straight back into it with Chris. Something I want to ask you. Yep. It always uh, intrigues me with referees. Yep. Referees, if maybe you get something wrong, but referees are always a target yes. for a fan of a fighter that it doesn't go their way. So, have you had any? Have you suffered any abuse in the ring or um, outside the ring? I've had abuse, sort of abuse at me, vocal abuse and so on. Yeah, I've been on a Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, or you've had the referees, this, that, and the other, as you get. Um, but overall, it's in ninety-nine percent of it. It's been okay because I have sort of tried to judge and sort of call it as a sort of neutral and sort of equal and the correct way it should be. 
Uh, that's the thing about refereeing. Like, if you do a good job, you don't get any praise, no notes. That's what you're supposed to do. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. You do a bad job and yeah. everyone's on you. Ah, you stopped too early. Yeah, and yeah. That's, and that's, that's the thing. Like, right. you know, it's a bit of a thankless job. Really. Yeah. It is a massively thankless job, and you've got that minute second to make that call. If you make that call too early, and the box goes, whoa, whoa, I'm all right, I'm all right, ref, I'm all right, you've gone in too early, or you've got the opposite effect, and you've gone in too late. But ultimately, that referee is there to defend the safety and make sure that fighter is safe. Uh, as a ref, or oh, sorry, do but as a ref, yeah, kind of a silly question, but too early or too late? What would you rather? Around 99, 100% too early. So that boxer can walk away and he can box again. Too late, you don't know what. Happen. We've seen like over the probably the last two years and we a lot of yeah. serious injuries where fights have gone on a round or two yeah. too late. And so yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. But at, at the same time, you look at Enzo Martinelli mm -hmm. and even stop. Yeah. Way too early, yeah. nothing wrong. Well, I suppose, sort of thing, I suppose yeah. what Chris says though about like you, they can fight another day, Enzo got justice, yes, he got his yeah, rematch yeah. and totally agree, what yeah. happened in the second fight was probably what was going to happen yeah. in the first fight. A fight is always going to think they can go on and yeah, yeah, end yeah. up getting carried out on their shield, they will, yeah. like you know, no one wants to quit, even if, even if you're hurt you want to yeah. show face and say oh, I'm fucking fine. Like, yeah, you know? a fighter is their own worst enemy, they've yeah. trained for 12, 16 weeks for that one event Again, they sold so many tickets, they don't want to go out as a loser. They want to give, give everything, they want to carry on until the end. Unfortunately, you are there to protect them to ensure they don't get further hurt. And your margin for error is a lot smaller than the fighter because your yeah. decision's final. They yes. can make a mistake, they might get clipped, but they can get back up. You know, it, it's not definitely the end. Your, yeah. your margin for error is it's a lot smaller. Definitely. There's that fight, um, Graham Earl and... Katsidis. Katsidis. Yeah. I can't say it, really. And his corner tried throwing oh, the towel yeah. in, didn't they? Yeah, Johnny. And he kicks it out. Oh, Mickey Van. Was that Mickey yeah. Van? Yeah, and he booted the and towel. Yeah. And, and, they, and, you know, they, they had, like, a knockdown war for another round, yeah. but they were trying to throw the towel in. That's, yeah. that's the thing. And I suppose, like we said, if you make a mistake, they're going to jump on you. Yeah. Um, everyone still talks about the George Groves, Carl yeah. Falk first yeah. fight too early. But if it's too late, as Dewey said, there could be a tragedy involved, you know. It's, so for you, what... what it's harder. Do you, did you find competing yeah. uh, in the combat sport harder or refereeing the combat sport? The training is obviously harder competing. <laughs> um, but I say it's harder probably officiating or refereeing because of that fine margin of detail. Um, particularly as you've got into professional boxing now, these are people's livelihoods. You're stopping. They, they could be on a 19 and 0 winning streak and you make that call to stop that fight you can set their wages for the next few fights down the level. Same as a junior man, they, they fight every week, yeah. and if you stop them, that's they a got, month. They've got 28 yeah. days they can't yeah. box, so you have that area of responsibility, but you've got to sort of stick by the rules and regs, and you go, you make your call. Do you ever, do you know, like, you look into fighters sometimes, and, like, Enzo's uh, against Oval McKenzie, the first fight's a perfect yeah. example, uh, that the referees seem to judge Enzo before the fight as being, you know, he had yeah. this reputation of being chinny, over mm -hmm. was a big puncher. Yeah. Do you look into the background or do you judge no, every I, fight the same? I try to judge every fight the same. Um, it's a minefield of you, especially going now and you've got favoritism, biotism, biotism. Um, no, I try to fight neutral as I can. Mm -hmm. The brand, just, there's just two boxes, boxer A, boxer B, or red and blue, and that's that. So does it make it hard though, if you're like a fan of the sport? And then someone like yeah. Enzo comes in, yeah. and you're like, oh, he's my hero, but his last fight, he got knocked out. Could you have that in the back of your mind? Because um, for me, I, like, I watch fights, and I, I have to turn like the commentary off sometimes yeah. on Sky Sports, because they, they sway me. I'm like, yeah. oh, he's doing well, and then they'll say something. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, what do I know yeah. about boxing? Like, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it, it, does, not, it, it does happen, but I, I reckon the reason why we notice it so much is because it's so rare. So when it had, like George Groves, Carl Frotch was another one, like everyone expected Frotch to come on late and the referee might have been 30 seconds too early in that first fight. It does happen, but I think it's very rare. That's why we remember it so much when yeah, it does yeah, happen. Yeah, true, very true. Um, talk about now, touch quickly on it, that you've been training for the past two years yes. to become a British Boxing Border Control yeah. official referee, yeah. professional referee. Yeah. Uh, when was the Swansea show? Last month? Three weeks ago. July? July? Yeah. Yeah. July 22nd, July, I think. Yeah. yeah, just half my birthday, yeah, July. You got your first bout yep. under your belt as an official professional boxing referee yeah. in your hometown. Yeah. 
in the Swansea Leisure Centre, yeah. where you work, yeah. kind of all the stars aligned, dream scenario, and you officiated three bouts on the night. Yes. So, what was that like? Tell us. Again, you nailed it there. It could not have been scripted better in a way. It's where I work, it's where I sort of manage a big team there, and I'm turning up there to make my debut in Swansea. It doesn't sort of get better than that. But obviously, prior to all that, is all the training I've done. Um, with the Boxing Board of Control for the last so two years, as you said, attending shows, listening to um, referees who are currently doing um, combat sports, or like Reese Carter, Martin Williams, and Dave uh, Williams, watching them, um, Dave Walter, sorry, Martin Williams, um, watching how they referee and learning from them as well. So I've sat ringside watching them, uh, picking up their sort of skills and how they conduct themselves as a referee, and that all allowed me to step in and do it, um, and I think it went pretty successful. Do you know what, do you know, just to add to that, what I yeah. think, what referees are judge on is the decision making, yeah. but I think the, the officials you've quoted, that yeah. you've referenced there, yeah. they're all very good communicators. Yes. I think that's what separates average referees from very yes. good referees, because you know exactly where you stand with them. I think so. You said, uh, I, obviously you was at the show, you said that Chris, he was impressed by, obviously he would expect some nerves. Yeah. You'd expect news with it just be in your first bout. Yes. But like you said, it's in a place of work, yeah. in your hometown. Yeah. So I'd expect the news to be even more yeah. than usual. But you said that all about you couldn't you couldn't find a fault to do. No, I said um, you didn't look like a new referee as such. Yeah. And you kind of fell into place and you know, you wouldn't have told any different. Yeah. The only thing I did mention was um, they give you like hand signals from ringside, and they—I um, don't know if you—they they were meant to, but I—I I don't know if it was between the rounds. Why don't they give you a European just to tell you? Um, <laughs> woof. Is that because they could influence? Yeah, the it, it wasn't really hand signals. I suppose I was sort of locking there, making sure I'd done a good yeah. job. Nerves again. I mean, yeah. it's my 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 time. Sort of. I thought they were they no, were trying no, to get no. your attention for something. No, oh, right. no. Wait, wait, it works, guys. Okay, I'm still. Well, I'm doing my. Professional referee now, I'm still classed as a trainee referee. I just got the practical experience now, so um, I passed the sort of assessments to allow me to go into the ring. And the way that works then is that I referee the, the bout that takes place, I score it myself. However, there's an A class referee ringside who is also scoring that, that bout as well. And it's their official scorecard that goes in. So I'm still classed as a trainee. Um, but yeah, there was no sort of hand signal. I just put a look in. Am I doing a good job? Have I messed things up? And then at the end of the show, I had a debrief with Reese Carter, and he explained a few things. Again, nerves were there. A few things I need to work on, but it all went well. Said that I, I couldn't. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't have been able to tell the difference if if I was outside the yeah. sport. You know, I wouldn't have known you were like a trainee ref. Which, so. which is good in a way, because I've had that prior to the last two years, then six years of. Compete of sort of refereeing a red and a blue corner, or competing with two different corner men, trying to influence the referee and so on. So I've had that experience. I think if I hadn't had that and just gone straight into the ring, a lot more nerves would have kicked in. Um, I'd have been a lot more happy, apprehensive to make a decision. Like for example, if you remember the first fight, the boxer actually spat his gum shield out for a rest because he was getting beaten. Now uh, you carry on boxing because are uh, you looking for a break? I'll I'll call the break. And I did that, I think it was the second round. And they were impressed with that. I didn't sort of <coughs> clap and go, whoa, whoa, stop, stop, stop. I done it how, as the rules should be. So I, was, I, I had good feedback from that. Do you know you had um, two and a half years as a, like a scorer yeah. at ringside? As a pra doing your practical assessments, yes. if you like now, do you have like a, a quota, an amount of fights you have to do? Or if you're ready, um, you know, could it be the next yeah, show it's, where you do both jobs? It is, uh, when you're ready, it's um, what we'll do I, with the Welsh Area Council. They will then sort of, if I, they think, I'm, they believe I'm ready, they'll recommend me to what they call a referees committee. On that then you have A star referees, uh, recognisable across the UK. They will then sort of bring me in and sort of look at my sort of scoring, they will look at sort of the practical ability and the fight reports that they've received on me and they'll then make a decision then if I then become sort of a full professional referee, uh, what they call B class is the sort of entry level. Mm -hmm. So then from there then you sort of, however many shows you do, you progress up that ladder. But I don't think there's an actual quota, it's whether you're good enough, whether you get the <coughs> availability. If you're good enough, you'll make it. Which, again, like you should be. Yeah. What, like you say, you've wanted to be a referee in yeah. whatever sport. You've gone down the yes. boxing route. Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> what does the future hold? You're, you're a young guy, you're in yeah. your 30s. Yeah. Referees, if you, if you generally think of a referee, you yeah. think late 40s, 50s, yes. whatever it may be, but yeah. you're, like you say, you're in your 30s, 10, 15 years, you're still going to be a young referee. So yeah. what, what's the long-term plan for, for yourself? And that, that, you're spot on there. And that's sort of reason why I sort of kept within that boxing sport. Um, they are in their sort of 50s and 60s, so there's going to be a gap. Oh, they need boxers or referees coming underneath them. If I can sort of slide on that, I can build my experience at the local shows, build my way up, and the ultimate aim is, yeah, British title, European title, and world title at the end. Referee one of them. Brilliant. Well, guys, we're going to wrap it up. Dewey, thanks for coming on. Thanks Boxing Wales, ain't going anywhere. It's staying there. Hmm. Um, Twitter, Facebook, you can get it all. Uh, Chris, Thank you. congratulations on... Thanks. I'm making the grade yeah. and all the best and we look forward to seeing you on some of the big shows Definitely. on the Sky Sports and uh, yeah, the nice. Box Nations. Yeah. So, thanks James. Thanks Dave. It's alright. <laughs> that's our very first episode and uh, that's a wrap. Thanks for watching. <laughs>